guys ready to get into the scriptures? All right. There's one primary passage we're going to look at this morning, and it's found in uh, the book of James, James chapter 4. We're going to be looking at just two verses. Now, we'll probably, I'll probably reference a couple of other verses in Proverbs, but primarily we're going to be looking at just these first two verses in the fourth chapter of James. If you don't have your Bible, the, the, the verses will be on the screen. But um, we've been talking about family. We've been talking about different aspects of our family dynamics, relationships, and, and how we can navigate through uh, different uh, ex- uh, challenges that we find in family. But even more than that, what we've, been wanting, what we've been doing is looking at the scriptures and trying to get a clear picture, a snapshot, what is in the heart of God concerning our families. What is in his heart? What was his plan? What does he want our families to look like? How does he want our families to function? We just finished a marriage seminar in, uh, or seminar series, and we talked about marriage, which really is the cornerstone of family, and so now we're looking at the whole family unit. And so what I'd like for us to take a look at today is something that's common in every family. It doesn't matter what kind of family you have. It doesn't matter how large or small your family might be. This is something that we all deal with, and that is conflict in family. Conflict. Every family is going to have conflict. I said last weekend, I don't think I invented this quote, but it's really good, and that is this. Conflict is inevitable. Combat is optional. You get the difference? Conflict is just a normal part of relationships. Our relationships with friends, our relationships in family, our marriage relationships. Conflict is normal. You can't, you're not going to escape conflict. It's there. It happens. It's a part of life. Matter of fact, years ago, for example, I was listening to a guy preach, and he said, rather pridefully, if I might say, he, he made this statement that my wife and I, we never argue. We never argue. Never argue. I'm listening to this guy. He said, he said it right out loud. We never argue. And I'm sitting there thinking, one of two things is happening then. Uh, well, I guess maybe one of three things. Either you're lying, which I suspected, because you're going to argue. Come on, folks, right? But really, one of two things are happening there. Either, either um, they just never dealt with issues, and they just buried things under the carpet, and they really never dealt with anything, or she was so afraid of him, she never brought anything up. Because he was dominating, uh, you know, in an unhealthy way in that, in that marriage relationship. My point in what I'm saying is that we all have conflict in our families. And uh, I'm telling you, there are, we're going to take a look at something that I really believe is fundamental, foundational for us in discovering God's resolution to those conflicts that we have in our families so that we don't end up hurting each other or tearing at the fabric of our families destroying one another, uh, either temporarily or for years. Some families, there's family members that haven't spoken to each other for years. That's not in the heart of God. That doesn't need to happen. It doesn't need to be the case. We want to see and discover God's wisdom. What does God have to say about this very common thing that we all deal with, conflict? So before we get into that, let me just talk about, uh, let's just kind of take a look at this here. We, there's different ways that people process conflict, for example. There's different ways that people process conflict. You might identify with one of these. The first one is what, I, was what we can call the peacemaker, the peacemaker. Now, this is the person who, uh, when conflict is starting or, you know, strife is starting, drama is beginning, this is the person that just wants everybody to get along. They want everybody to be at peace. They want everybody to like each other. They don't like strife. They don't like drama. They just want peace. There's nothing wrong with it. That's a great character uh, thing to have. It's a, it's a great quality. But the downside of that is oftentimes the peacemaker will want and try to create peace at any cost, which oftentimes means ignoring the reality of the conflict. There's another type of person that uh, they process a conflict a different way. They're called, uh, we can call them the sulker, the person who sulks, right? They wear it on their face. They may not say anything. They may not be argumentative. They may not be retaliating in any way, but they go off into a room and they sulk, okay? The sulker. Now, I want to say this. Um, don't label each other after we leave here, okay? Don't. 
Pastor Mike, you're a sulker. You're a, that's what you are, you know. Let's try to avoid that, all right? Uh, and, and then there's the stuffer. You see why I'm saying this, because we're all these little very catchy things here. The sulker, uh, or, or the stuffer, rather, the person who stuffs it all. Now, they don't respond, they're not, they don't react, and that's a positive thing. But the negative thing is, is this person just, if you don't know them very well, people outside the family don't know them very well, they, won't, they don't know they're mad. Because they become very, very good at hiding. See, the sulker, they wear their feelings. You can tell, right? The stuffer, they look like everything's fine, but it's not fine. It's fine on the outside, but on the inside, there's, the, the, there's this raging turmoil going on. There's, something's happening, right? They're, but they're stuffing their feelings. Now, the downside to that is you can only stuff so far. You reach the top, right? And then it just blows out. All right. So that's what ha- that, well, how that looks is, you know, you forget to take the trash out and all of a sudden there's this explosive reaction to this and you realize this is not just about the trash. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that's been stuffed that's now coming out. Right. The stuffer. Then there's the litigator, the litigator. Now, this person, this person, this person, they're they're very agile. They're quick on their feet. They think they can argue and they're incredible arguers. If they're not attorneys, you would say to them, you need to be a lawyer in a courtroom. The whole Tom Cruise thing, you need to be doing that. You know, a few good men thing. Anybody know that reference? Did I, just, did I age myself? Everybody get that? Okay. The litigator, the litigator. And so this is the person that's really, it's really hard. Everybody else, other than the litigator, you, you just back off. In the conflict, somewhere in the process of it, you just give up because they're too fast, they're too quick, they're too, and they're, they're, it's just, and it's overpowering, right? And now the litigator, they would admit that they were wrong, but they don't really believe they're ever wrong. They would tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll admit if I was wrong. I'm just never wrong. I'm the litigator. I got this, you know. Some of you are saying amen too loudly. All right. And then there's the screamer. And there is an upside to this. The upside is you don't have to wonder where they're at. (laughs) They've located themselves. Of course, the downside to the screamer is that obviously they believe that the resolution to the conflict is going to come as a result of volume. And so oftentimes it can it will escalate that conflict to levels that it doesn't really need to go. All right. Now, I say all this just and this is kind of maybe helpful for us to kind of look at how conflict uh, is processed differently by different people. But even though there's multiple, multiple reactions or responses to conflict, we've just seen this. Really, conflict only comes from one source. It, can, it may be processed a lot of different ways, but it only comes from one source. Everybody say one source. Just one, according to the scriptures. Just one source. And we see that, we find that source, we discover that in James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, the reason why it's so important for us to take a moment and look at these two verses is because... It is, as I said earlier, so fundamental, so foundational. If we're going to find and discover God's resolution to conflict, okay? Because I could give you a list of relational conflict resolution skills, little things that you can do, you and I can do. But none of those tools work if we don't understand the, the one true source of conflict. If we don't understand fundamentally or foundationally where it's coming from, it doesn't matter how many tools we've got in our toolbox relationally, right? It's just the application of it is not going to work. We've got to get to the root cause. This is what James is saying to us. He's showing us what is the root cause for conflicts, fights, and quarrels. And so here's what he says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? So in other words, he's beginning, he's saying right here, right off the bat, that the conflict that we have within ourselves creates conflict with others. He says, where do quarrels and fights, where does conflict come from? It comes from your desires that battle within you. You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. 
Now that may mean like if nations are rising up against nations, that may obviously could mean actual loss of human life. But it could also refer to the killing of a relationship. You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. So this is it. He's explaining to us what's the one source where conflict comes from. It comes from our desires, something that we want that we're not getting from someone else. And when we feel like we've reached an impasse, there's something blocking that, there's something threatening that, there's something that looks like we're not going to get what we want, it's not happening. James is telling us that's when the conflicts arise. Now, we may sit here and say, well, pastor, those things that I want are, are, are godly, they're biblical, they're only right. They may be. There are other times that there are things that we want that are unrealistic, that aren't fair, that aren't even right, that aren't even godly. James goes on and talks about that. But what he's saying here is he's actually really going to kind of peeling back a few more layers. He's saying, look, let's just get at the bottom of this. Let me tell you where it's actually coming from. Whether what you want is right or whether what you want is misguided, the conflict is coming from this. You want something from someone else that you're not getting, and it results in quarrels, fights, strife, conflict, arguments. That's what happens. You want something from somebody that you're not getting. Now, here's why this is so important. This is why I believe the scriptures are pointing this out. This is why I believe this is so life-giving. This is life-saving for us. Is because James is saying, all of this strife that you're having, all this conflict that's not being resolved. Because here's the thing about family. Here, here, here's the thing about family. Oh, just don't, uh, let me say it this way. When you win an argument within the context of a, fam a family, which includes the family unit or marriage, family. When you and I win an argument within the family, we don't win anything. We lose. Everybody loses. And see, that's different than out there in our other relationships. See, you can, in the boardroom, you can win an argument and you win. In the courtroom, we talked about this a moment ago, you can win the argument and persuade the jury, and you win. And somebody wins, somebody loses, you, you win. But in the living room and in the bedroom, you win an argument, you and I don't win anything, we lose. Does this make sense? So here's what James is saying. The conflict that's it's coming, you need to realize that it's coming from your desires, whether you feel like those desires are justifiable or whether they aren't justifiable at all, they're misguided, it's coming from you. So here's why he's saying this, because what he's saying is that here's, here's what ends up happening. When conflicts aren't resolved, it's because I'm looking to you and I'm saying, if you would just be different, if you would just stop doing this, or start doing that, you always do this. You always do that. Every time. If you would just, if you, right? And all of a sudden it's like, well, if you'll be different, I'll be okay. This conflict will be resolved. It's going to be all good in the hood. It's fine. I just need you to change. James is saying, listen, you're not looking at this correct. Let me tell you where this conflict and strife is really comes from. Where does it really, it comes from you. In other words, if I'm waiting for you to be different, for me to be happy, I'm going to always be unhappy. Because now all of a sudden, my joy, my peace, who I am, my integrity, my character, my ability to forgive, my patience, all of that is dependent upon how you act or respond or react to me. That's powerful, folks. James says, listen, it all starts with you, not them. You know the guy that's breaking up with a girl? It's not you, it's me. James is, the, the, James is saying, look, in the conflict and argument, you've got to come to the point where at some point within the context of that conflict, you've got to realize that there's an aspect of it. I don't care how big the slice, there's an aspect of you and not them. And you need to be willing to take responsibility for you. Does this make sense? You see what I'm saying? 
This verse, James 4, says, where does conflict, where does strife, where does all that? It comes from the desires in your heart, the things that you want that you're not getting. James is saying, take responsibility for your attitude, your, your, uh, uh, your reaction, your response, your desire. Take responsibility for you in the conflict. Watch what happens. You know the saying. I've said it, and it's wrong. I've said it so many times. You really make me mad. Anybody ever say that? You make me mad. They make me mad. This makes me mad. Right? And really what we're saying is, if you would just stop being you, I would not be. It's you. You're the reason why I'm upset. You're the reason why we're having a problem here. How have you realized that that doesn't resolve anything? All that is is put us in a position where somebody has to win, somebody has to lose, somebody's got to win the argument, somebody's got to admit they're right, and somebody's got to admit they're wrong. And once you just, if you'll just admit you're wrong, we're going to be fine. And James says, you've got it backwards. All of this is coming from you. But listen, he's not just saying it to you, he's also saying it to the person you're in conflict with. So it's us looking at us, right? And not, and not put, I asked the guys to make this graphic. Let me illustrate it this way. This might help. That green, let's say it's a green pie, not like a real pie. Obviously, that doesn't look edible. But that's just a green circle. That green circle represents conflict, whatever the conflict might be. How many of you have ever been in, how many of you have ever had an argument with your spouse while you're driving about the way that you're driving? <laughs> Anybody? Okay. How, how many of you have had an argument? Bonnie and I have had lots of those. Uh, if she would just drive like I drive. See, it's all her. It's not me, it's you. No, <laughs> just kidding. I, I'm kidding. Or, you know, whatever it might be. You know, I mean, they're just... Okay, so let's say whatever the conflict is, whatever the conflict is, this green circle represents the conflict, all right? And the red slice there represents our ownership of the conflict. It represents us taking responsibility for our part in the conflict. Now, I know some of us are thinking, I'm telling you, Pastor Mike, you don't know my parents. You don't know my family members. There's a time where it, it, honestly, it's all them. James is is saying, the scriptures are telling us that that's not accurate. So here's what, you know, it's hard. See, it's so hard for us at times, especially in the heat of it, right? It's so difficult to admit that we're wrong, even if it's just a little bit wrong, even if it's just a little slice. It's so hard for us to admit that we're wrong, and here's why. Because when we admit we're wrong, we think that we're giving up our leverage to be right. We lose the upper hand. We feel like that we're surrendering. We feel like that we're giving up. We feel like that we're losing something. James is saying if you keep going at this, not taking responsibility for your part in any conflict, you think if you take responsibility, even for some aspect of it, whatever it might be, that you're going to lose something. James is saying if you're not careful, you are going to lose something. You're going to lose everything because it comes from you initially. There's something, an aspect of it. There is an aspect in every conflict that I can adjust and that I can own, even if it's my attitude, even if it's the way I'm responding. Does this make sense, everybody? And the moment that we take responsibility, the moment that in, a, in an argument or a conflict, the moment that we one of us says, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I believe that I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a part of this that I'm responsible for. Now, in Bonnie and I's life, and, on our, and, our, and in our marriage, to, to illustrate it further, the times that one of us have said that, the conflict, every time something amazing happens, we see a resolution to the conflict. And the sooner that we say it, the sooner the conflict's resolved. And the longer it takes for us to say that, the longer the conflict and the tension 
remains. But when we, when we follow this pattern, we recognize where's the root of this. What's the one single source? There's something in me that I want that you're not giving me. I need to take responsibility for that. I need to take responsibility for some aspect of this conflict. I need to take responsibility for this. The moment that, listen, even if you don't, even if you think that you're taking more, can you throw, put that up there again? Even if you think you're taking more uh, of that slice, that slice is bigger than you want it to be. I'm telling you, something incredible happens when we go, wait, 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 wait. You know what? I, I, a big part of this is me. Even if, in all reality, listen to me. Even if, in all reality, it's not, there's still something supernatural and powerful that happens. Because you'll ultimately get to the root cause of that conflict in both you and your family members, if somebody will just grab a hold and own, uh, own a slice. See, here's, here's how I said it. It's very cheesy. It was so cheesy, I thought I'd share it with you. That's your cue. If you own a slice, you have to be nice. <laughs> All right, that, that's about the response I got in the last service, so at least I'm being consistent. The moment that we take response, the moment that we recognize the source of conflict. You didn't meet an expectation that I have. I can either come to you, you're wrong, I'm right, we're going we're gonna to confront each other in this. Or I can come to you and say, you know what, it, it could be me. I may not have been clear as I should have been. Or maybe I said something, I may have said something before that gave you the wrong but anyway, we're doing something to take responsibility. Does this make sense, everybody? You following what I'm saying? And here's what, and you think, well, that's just, that, how is that powerful? It's exactly what James is saying. It's coming from you. So take, stop getting, take the focus off of them and put the focus on you. And the moment we do that, we're opening the door in our relationships, in our family relationships, and we're inviting Jesus to walk right in the middle of that. And here's why that's so important. Because when Jesus gets involved, he doesn't take sides. He takes over. It's a big difference between the two. Right? Jesus doesn't take sides. He takes over. Now, how do you think it's always going to be a good thing when Jesus takes over my attitude, my reactions, my feelings, my opinions, Right? And Jesus takes over someone else's attitude. But let's give him the, the opportunity to do that. And by us taking responsibility for our part, I'm telling you folks, you talk about diffusing things. You can use all kinds of these relational skills and whip them out and all that stuff and try to apply them. But if we're not taking care of the core issue and dealing with the root cause, none of it works. But when our hearts are right, and there's that sincere, authentic, honest, listen, I need to take responsibility for some of this. Don't tell me it doesn't change the climate of that, of that family dynamic because I've seen it. It's powerful. And the reason why it's so powerful is because it's, it's God. It's an expression of the love of God. It's the expression of the patience of God. It's the expression of the kindness of God, right? It, 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 it's, it just changes everything. Try it. Uh, no, don't create conflict to try it, but because it'll come. But when it comes, try that. Say, wait, wait, wait. Part of this, I think, is, is, is my fault. And if you've never said that before, your spouse will pass out. <laughs> you don't have to wake them up. No, honey, really serious. I'm sorry. I think part of it's my fault. <laughs> and they're going to be, they might be thinking the rapture's coming now because <laughs> all things, the kingdom has now been completed. But, but. <laughs> So James goes on to say, that, here's the thing, Proverbs 13.10, here's what it says. It says, pride leads to what, everybody? Conflict. So the opposite would bring peace, to be humble, to lower ourselves, to be humble, Okay? And so then James goes on and says this. He, the rest of verse 2 says this. 
Um, you don't have, now the conflict's coming because there's something you want, you're not getting. Then he goes on to say, and you don't have because you don't ask God. You don't have because you don't ask God. So if we're talking about fights, we're talking about uh, strife, we're talking about conflict, we're talking about quarrels right now. James says it all comes from this desire that you have that springs out from you. You want something. You're not getting it from that person. So it's creating this conflict. He goes on to say you don't have because you don't ask God. You know, you know what he's telling us here? Instead of trying to impose what you want, why don't you take a step back? Have you thought about praying for them? Have you thought about praying about the situation? Have you thought about praying about the strife? God, I don't like that there's this wedge between myself and my daughter or my son or a family member or my spouse. And God, I know how I feel and I'm angry and I'm frustrated and I know they are too. But God, I'm coming to you and I'm asking you, show me in my, is there anything I need to adjust in my life? What do I need to do, Father? And then God, I'm asking you to bless them, strengthen them, uh, minister your love and your grace to them, Father. Show me how I can minister that to them and how, show me how I can express your kindness to them. I'm telling you, that'll change. Change your perspective. Right? I know this is so, it's so simple, it's easy to miss. James is like, it's all coming from all this stuff. But why don't you take a step back and instead of trying to leverage what influence you think you have, instead of trying to intimidate, instead of trying to muscle and, and, and force them and bring the change and get them to change, why don't you just take a step back and why don't you just pray? Now, we do believe that God answers prayer, right? We do believe the Holy Spirit is alive and well. We do believe that God does supernatural things when we come to Him and ask heaven to, to touch and kiss earth. We do believe that, right? James says, well, if you believe in prayer, it's powerful. He, he goes on to say that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Hey, prayer is powerful. Then just pray for Him. Take a step back. Drink some iced tea. Eat a piece of fruit and pray. I don't know why I put all those in there. I find comfort in those. So two things happen when we pray. One is our perspective changes. It's amazing how the times I prayed for Bonnie, the Lord will show me where I've been selfish and self-centered. Hmm. That hurts, right? But it's a good hurt, isn't it? And then the other thing that happens when we pray is that it allows God to do what only He can do. And there are situations in, 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 that creates conflict within family members. There's stuff going on in our hearts or in our lives or in the lives of, 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 of our family members. Or maybe the rift is so great, the wounds are so deep, listen to me, that there's nothing you and I can do to make it right. When we pray, those two things happen. One, our perspective changes, but number two, it allows God to do what only He can do. To heal the hurts, to tear down the wall between us and family members, to change our hearts towards one another. How many of you would agree with me that there's just some stuff, there's nothing we can do to make it right or fix it or repair it, right? I mean, there's just some situations in families, some kind of conflict, there's some strife, there's some some of that stuff is so deep, folks, it's so deep that only God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, is going to fix that and repair it. When we pray, it gives God an opportunity to do what only He can do. Isn't that good? Is this helpful, yes or no? Let's pray. Father, you know exactly, you know, as we've looked at this passage of Scripture, today I, I, I'm, I'm confident that there were Many of us that were thinking of family members, whether it's a spouse, or a, a mother, a father, a brother, uncle, extended family, where the relationships have been torn, the relationships are strained, um, there's tension there, there's ongoing conflict there, and we haven't seen resolution for it. But I really believe that what you give us and what you're giving us this morning is the first step to seeing something supernatural happen 
in our lives, in our own hearts first, as well as in our families. So Father, we just invite you to walk in. We take responsibility for our part, whatever that is. And we, we, we invite you, we open that door and allow you to walk in. Because we know that when you come in, you don't take sides. You really do take over. And we're inviting you to do exactly that, to take over. And Father, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Everybody said, can we thank God for his word one more time? Can we do that?